Well, Paul started chapter 4 by saying in verse 1, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. And the ministry he's speaking about is that he has been made an apostle and a minister of the new covenant. And what comes with being a minister of the new covenant, or the gospel, are trials and troubles and sufferings for Jesus' sake. And lose heart means to be utterly spiritless, to, t to lack courage, to throw in the towel, to quit, to compromise, to, be, to become beaten down. It literally means to give in to evil. Uh, it's, it's where a person becomes faint-hearted or despondent because of their trials and because of the difficulties they're going through. And, and if anyone could have lost heart, it would have been the Apostle Paul. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, if we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, uh, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so we, we despaired even of life. And he was constantly persecuted, constantly having to look over his shoulder. He had enemies everywhere he went, and some of them wanted to hurt him, some of them wanted to kill him. He was beaten, flogged, put in chains and stocks, stoned, in prison, shipwrecked, not to mention his deep concern for all the churches. His deep concern has false apostles and, and false teachers and infiltrated the churches, preaching heresy, preaching heresy, trying to fleece the sheep and to move them away from Christ. So he had opposition from inside the church and opposition from outside the church. And he could have easily lost heart. And at times, we are prone to lose heart, are we not? As we labor for the Lord, but we don't see any visible fruit. Right? When we reach out to others and they don't respond. When we evangelize and it seems like absolutely no one is interested. We lose heart because it seems like there is so little passion for Christ, so little zeal for His glory, so little commitment to His kingdom, even in the churches. And we lose heart when we feel like the odd man out, not invited to certain things because of who we are, not welcome at certain functions because of who we are in Christ. We lose heart because we struggle, we struggle with our own sin. And it beats us down. And we want to live for the glory of God, but we often don't. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And as believers, we're told not to lose heart. Jesus said in John 14, 27, let not your heart be troubled. I.e., don't lose heart. Don't be afraid. Don't give in to despair. We're told in Psalm 31, 24, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. You who hope in the Lord. Jesus told the parable of the persistent widow in, in Luke 18 for this very purpose. He says it right in verse 1. He says that men ought always to pray in what? Not lose heart. He knows how prone we are, right? He knows how prone we are. So we're not to lose heart. And Paul says this. He says, I don't lose heart. I don't lose heart. He may have lost sleep. He may have lost friends. He may have lost his freedom. But here's the thing. He doesn't lose heart. And not lose heart is in the present tense. And so it means he never loses heart. He never loses heart. And he's not bragging here. He's not saying, I'm better than the rest of you guys because I don't do what you do. He says, I never lose heart. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. He's stating a fact. And he finishes out the fourth chapter just the way he started it, saying in verse 16, therefore, we do not lose heart. And, and I would think he's anticipating the question that some of his readers might be asking because of what comes between verse 1 and verse 16 particularly verses 8 and 9, where he says, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Then in verse 11, he says, for we who, are, we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. So, so it would seem like Paul did lose heart. It would seem that way. I mean, how can you, you take such punishment such a bombardment, such an encroachment by other people, and not lose heart. Well, he says, I didn't lose heart. And you don't have to either. You don't have to either. 
And then in verses 16 to 18, he gives us three ways, what three truths on how not to lose heart. And he does so through a series of contrasts, like the outward man and the inward man, like wasting away and being renewed, like momentary and eternal and affliction and glory, and what can be seen and what can't be seen. And what I'd like to do is to look at these verses today in a sermon titled, An Eternal Weight of Glory, giving you these three ways not to lose heart. And they are by, re, by being renewed in the inward man, secondly, by remembering glory is eternal, and finally, by fixing your eyes on the unseen, by fixing your eyes on the unseen. So let's look at the first one, by being renewed in the inner man. Verse 16, Paul says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Uh, so Paul says, even though our outward man is perishing, right? And the word even though means this is a fact, an indisputable fact. Outward means the body. Uh, and he's already called the body an earthen vessel in verse 7. It's called it our mortal flesh in verse 11. He will call it an earthly house or a tent in chapter 5, verse 1. And perishing means decaying, corrupting, de being destroyed. And perishing is in the present tense. So our bodies are always in the process of perishing. And we all know, we all know that the outward man is perishing. We understand this. Listen, if you're even a few decades old, I'll say like more than three, right? That's about the fair majority here, right? You understand this. You agree with this. Uh, uh, for there are things that you were once able to do that you can no longer do. They don't work so much anymore, right? You can't run up the steps by two and three at a time anymore. Can you, Chuck? I don't think so. I can't either, right? You can't lift as much weight as you once did, right? I can't. Proverbs 20, 29 says, the glory of young men is their strength, is their strength. And as we get older, we have less and less of that. We just do, right? The bones lose density. We begin to shrink. The, sin, the skin becomes loose. We gain chins. We grow crow's feet. Gravity takes its toll on us. The joints and the limbs, they begin to hurt. We don't see things as well as we used to see them. Our hearing starts to go. The legs get shaky. We seem to forget more and more things. We get tired easier. We don't sleep so well. Can anybody say they agree with any of that? Amen. So, from the 86-year-old guy with cancer. Right? And we need medicine for things that we never needed before. So we know the outward man is perishing. We know it. Listen, David was once a mighty man of valor who slayed 10,000s of his Lord's enemies. But we read in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1, Now David, King David, was old, advanced in years, and they put covers on him because he could not get warm. The mighty warrior could not get warm. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 says, Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. I'm looking at some young people here. I see young people in there. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw nigh when you say, I have no pleasure in them. And the difficult days, you know what they are? As you get older and you become consumed with the pains and struggles and agonies of your bodies and the frailties that you all of a sudden have that you didn't have before. So here it is. Seek God when you're young. Seek Him when you're young is what he's saying. Again, we know these bodies won't last forever. In fact, Moses said in Psalm 90, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength, well, you'll get 10 more. And that's not an absolute. People live into their 90s. Some people never make it out of their 30s. But it's a, a more or less literal thing. All right? Paul said in Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's dying. And if anyone knew about the outward man perishing, I am sure it was the Apostle Paul. Although I don't think he was a very old man, you know, he probably seemed to be like a very old man, right? And I guess 
he probably felt like a very old man. Uh, he, he most likely was one of those guys, when you looked at him, he looked old, probably a lot older than he really was. And why is that? Uh, he lived a hard life as a believer. He was beaten often, imprisoned often, stoned, shipwrecked, had many sleepless nights, always on the run from his persecutors, not including the pressures of the peddlers of the word of God who had infiltrated the churches. It's like somebody who did drugs or drank for 20, 30 years, and now you look at them, they look like they're 80, and they might be 50. A lot of wear and tear. Well, well Paul... Paul's wear and tear was not because of drinking, not because of drugs, not because he worked in the sun all day. His wear and tear was for Christ's sake and for the gospel's sake. Uh, and he knew this body wasn't long for this world. But he didn't lose heart. He didn't lose heart because of his struggles and the breaking down of his own body because he understood the outward man is perishing and that the inward man is being renewed day by day. So in spite of his physical limitations, in spite of his aging mind, in spite of his lack of abilities and agilities and stability, he didn't lose heart because his inward man was constantly being renewed. And the inward man is that unseen part of us. It is the soul or the spirit of a man. It's the part of us that was brought to life when God regenerated us. Uh, it's the part of us which is alive to God right now. The inward man is what Peter would say in 1 Peter 3, the hidden man of the heart. Or, it's what Ephesians 4.24 calls the new man. The new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. It's, it's now the new heart and the new spirit which God puts in us from Ezekiel 36. Uh, the inward man is where we are a new creation in Christ, which we'll see in chapter 5. It's the part of us which is right now, right now seated with Christ in the heavenly places. I'm blown away by that thought. Right? Ephesians, Ephesians 2. Right now, you're in a man, if you will. Seated with him in the heavenly places. Talk about being united and unified, right? With Christ. Uh, it's, it's the part of us that makes us pure in heart. It's the part of us that desires to do the will of God from the heart. Uh, and because the inward man is being renewed, we no longer have an evil heart. We no longer have an evil heart of unbelief, we're told in Hebrews 3. Uh, so the body is the natural man or the outward man, and the soul or the spirit, that's the inward man. That's the inward man. And the inward man is being renewed. And renewed means to make new, to refresh, to strengthen, to renovate. Paul said in Colossians 3.10, to put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So in other words, live who you are. Live who you are. You've been born again. You've been given the spirit of God. You're a new creation. Live that way. Live that way. So we're renewed, a growing in our knowledge of God. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, for they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And they are not weary and not fainting in their inner man. It's not saying their legs don't get tired. It's not saying they can run the mile in you know, four, point, you know, four minutes. It's saying in their inner man, they don't grow weary. Ephesians 3.16, Paul prays that God would strengthen the saints through his spirit in their inner man. Amen. Inner man. Paul tells us in Romans 12.2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the inner man. And the mind is renewed as we put in the word of God into it and seek to live by that. So because we are, are alive spiritually, we can and must be continually renewed spiritually. Listen, like we feed our natural bodies every day, we need also to feed the inner man every day. Now the word renewed is in the passive voice, which indicates our inward man is being renewed by an outside power. This is not something that we're stirring up ourselves. It's an outside power, which of course is God. Uh, and, and the word is also in the present tense, uh, which indicates we're continually being renewed until the Lord calls us home. The moment he saved you, the moment you became born again, regenerated, right? right? He put his spirit in you, made you alive. 
And he's going to continue to renew you until he brings you home. Perfect, amen? Uh, and, 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 and this is a process which is synonymous with progressive sanctification. So we're always being sanctified. We never stop growing. We never stop being sanctified once we're saved. Right? Uh, so, so we need to continually, day by day, to be renewed in our inward man, to help us walk holy, to help us battle the flesh, to help us live a life of loving obedience to Christ, to be faithful to whatever he's called us to do or to be. You see, we have a body or the flesh that wants its own ways, that wants to drive us back to the old ways. That's what we have. We have that, and we struggle with that. It wants to bring us back there. Right? Before we were saved, it wants us to go back there. We have a flesh that can be swayed to love again the very things that God has saved us out of and that put Christ on the cross. Well, Paul didn't lose heart. When, when, when most men would have, have cashed in their chips, Paul stayed the course. He stayed the course because he had experienced the daily spiritual renewal, renewal of God in his life within himself. And although his body was wasting away, his soul still hungered and thirst for God. And God kept satisfying it, kept pouring into it, giving him the bread of life, the water of life, kept giving it to him. Brothers and sisters, the key here is this. The key to this daily renewal is to be daily in the Word. Daily reading, daily meditating on it, daily praying to him for all things through Christ and worshiping him privately and corporately and coming together as the body for the preaching and teaching of the word and fellowshipping with the saints, knowing that iron sharpens iron and choosing the spiritual over the temporal. So although Paul was not a physically strong man, he was certainly a spiritually strong man. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 10, that he was content in his weaknesses. Here's why. He said, for when I am weak, well, then I'm strong. Then I'm strong. This is why he experienced such great spiritual success in his life. In fact, his inward man was not hindered, but actually helped, him by, helped by those troubles that he had to, to assail his outward man, so to speak. And dear saints, they can aid our inward man as well. Our troubles, our trials, our struggles... God it could be using them in our lives and should be using them, we should see it this way, to grow us, to strengthen us in our inward man. And so, we do not lose heart, first of all, by being renewed in the inward man. Secondly, by remembering glory is eternal. By remembering glory is eternal. Verse 17. For a light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, Paul starts by saying, for a light affliction, and light means not heavy, not weighty, not a burden. Affliction means tribulation. It means distress. All right, he, was, you know, he used this word in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. He says, for out of much affliction, there's the word, and anguish of heart, I wrote to you. He'll use it again in chapter 6. He'll use it again in chapter 7, and he'll use it again in chapter 8. He told the Philippians in Philippians 4, you have done well that you have shared in my distress. All right, there's the word affliction. Uh, we know that he had great and constant afflictions. He said in verses 8 and 9 of this chapter that he was hard-pressed on every side. He was perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. He'll say in chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, that he suffered afflictions, hardships, stripes, imprisonments, tumult, sleeplessness, and hunger. And he'll expand that in chapter 11, when he, he gives us the, the resume of suffering, he says, where he says, he says that in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robber, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, 
in sleeplessness often, in hunger, in thirst, in fastings often, in cold, and nakedness. I mean, is that distress? Is that affliction? I mean, most of us, I don't think one of these things would be our problem. And yet they were all his, his life. And the disconnect for us here, maybe after all of this, how can Paul say his afflictions were light? Like, how could he say that? In the deep, flogged, beaten, stoned, I mean, the list is long. How could he say that they were light? Because to us, they're very heavy. Getting your back ripped open by being beaten with rods where skin is flying and nerves are showing and blood is spilling doesn't seem like a light affliction to us. Being cast in prison, stoned, doesn't seem like a light affliction to us. How many here have spent time in prison for doing the right thing? How many? I might get a few. For the sake of Jesus. How many of you have had their backs ripped open? How many have been stoned? Not many, I don't think. Doesn't seem like a light affliction. So what Paul calls light, most of us would say, that's colossal. That is huge. That's big stuff. Yet we may be mocked for offering someone a gospel track, and to us, that's a huge affliction. Or... People oppose us for not allowing our kids to do what other kids do because it goes against what we believe. That's a huge affliction for us. Or we may be shunned by family and friends for our stance on Christ. Whoa, that's a huge affliction for us. Or the name calling or the gossip by coworkers and family because of our faith in Christ. That's a huge affliction for us. And some professing believers, guess what? They don't want to suffer any affliction for the gospel's sake. Light or heavy. You can say, how about light? No, I don't want light either. But Paul calls his afflictions light because he knew they were temporary or for a moment. And he compared them to the glory to come which made them minuscule. Made them minuscule. Now, when he says they're light, He's not saying they don't hurt. He's not saying he doesn't ask God to heal him or to get rid of them. Remember, in chapter 12 of this book, he pleads with God three times to take away the thorn in the flesh that he had. And by the way, God said no. And when he says there for a moment, he doesn't mean 60 seconds. Two days ago, I'm in bed. It's like 5 in the morning. I said to my wife, I had such a bad cramp in my, in, my, in my calf. I thought I was dying. I mean, for five minutes, I was like, like grimacing in pain. I've never felt it that bad before. And I, and, I, and I just thought that was it. But it only lasted for five minutes. I was, oh, thank you, Lord. Five minutes. That's not what he's saying here. He doesn't mean that. He's not saying 60 seconds. He doesn't mean 60 minutes. He doesn't even mean 60 years, right? Maybe they are for 60 seconds. Maybe they are for six years or 60 years. But when compared to eternity, they're like a dot on a 10,000-mile line, right? They're like a dot. They're like a grain of sand on the beach. It's as if Paul has a scale, and on one side he puts all of his afflictions, and on the other side he puts an eternal weight of glory. And what happens when that eternal weight of glory goes again? Boom! It goes way down. And those afflictions, they go way up. They don't compare. They don't compare. In fact, the ESV renders this verse, this momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Here it is, beyond all comparison. We can't compare. Which means there's no comparison when you consider your afflictions in light of an eternal glory. No comparison. So Paul views his afflictions as light because he views them from the perspective of eternity. He viewed them in light of the glory to come which is eternal and thus it is weighty. It is weighty. So it is because of the coming glory which is so weighty that his present affliction seems so light. He knows his sufferings are not forever. He knows there will be an end of them. 
He knows the worst that man can do to him is take his life. But they can't touch his soul. And quite honestly, if they take his life, you know what they'll be doing for him? They'll be catapulting him into heaven with the very Christ he wants to be with anyway. And he knew what Romans 8.28 says. He wrote it. That all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So even his afflictions are working for his good. Even his suffering is being used by God in his life and it's for the advancement of the kingdom. So our suffering is for a season, just as Christ's suffering in this world was for a season or a moment. And he certainly didn't lose heart, did he? And by the way, his suffering, can, can't, you can't compare his suffering to our suffering. Hebrews 12, 12, 2 says, for the joy that was set before him. What's that joy, by the way? That's the glory to come. That's the glory to come. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, and then that joy was the eternal glory. That was, he was going to have glory with us. Listen, he was looking at us. He was seeing us with him in glory, the bride and the bridegroom, together forever. And so the cross, although it was brutal, although he begged God the, the night before, if it was his will to take it away, let the cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. Let me say this. If God would have granted that request, we're all doomed. We're all damned. Now he came for us. And he came for us, and the work he had to do was he had to live for us, he had to die for us, he had to take our sins away, he had to pay the price. The Spirit had to come and regenerate us so he can come back for us and bring us to him. That's how much your father loves you. That's how much your father loves you. So suffering doesn't last because this life doesn't last. And as I said, our lives are short. In the big scheme of things, they're really short. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. It says our lives are like vapor. We're not going to see it now, but let me tell you, when it's a little cold, we will see it. You out, if we see it for a second or two, it goes away. First Chronicles 29 says that our days on earth are like a shadow. Here now, sun moves around, it's gone. Job 14.1 says our days here are few and full of trouble. They start out, boom, you got trouble. But they end pretty quick. And Psalm 39 says our days are like hand breaths. I mean, they're short, they're like this long. So Paul knew nothing in this life was permanent. He knew if, if he lived for Christ here, that he would be with him forever in glory. Which, what did he call? Gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. But how many view what they have, what they have, uh, or, or, or where they are in this life is permanent. How many people living here, even Christians, think that this is the end all? That, that we're hanging on to this. We don't want this to end. We want to keep it here. But it can't stay here. No man can stay here. And as Christians, we know that. And if we're really in the word and we're understanding the truths of the gospel, we know something so much better is coming than this. Because if you don't, then what happens when you hear things like, well, I'm sorry, so-and-so, you have stage four cancer, get your affairs in order, you'll be gone in six months. What do we do? Do we fall apart? Do we crumble? Are we a, are we a bag full of nerves? Or do we remember the truth that we're in Christ's hand and he's bringing us home? All right, we need that. And by the way, God doesn't, we're saying grace, grace, marvelous grace. But the grace we're going to need at the end is dying grace. Grace that we could have joy anticipating and expecting to be with Christ. Amen? Remind me of that if I'm there before you. Well, Paul is saying the problems of this life, which seem so heavy right now, uh, and which seem like they will never end right now, uh, and are causing you great distress right now, are really just waiting for a moment. Uh, so, so you can weather them and continue serving God uh, because there's a much bigger picture going on here. Because what the afflictions are doing for the child of God is preparing them for something. What? An eternal weight of glory. They are preparing them for something much weightier, 
which is glory. You see, our afflictions help take our eyes off of this world and the pleasantries of this world and help us to put them on eternal things. They help us to consider what is really important. Right? They, they help to grow our desire for what isn't perishing, which is glory. They remind us of who we are in Christ and what's coming our way because of who we are in Christ. So our afflictions for Christ only help, help us to long for the one we suffer for. Uh, and, and, and we know, we know that the cross comes before the crown. It's sad for the believer or the preachers that are saying that you could have, have the crown now. No, suffering, the cross, comes now. Living for Christ and forsaking this world and sin, that comes now. Standing on the rock of Christ is what comes now. The crown comes afterwards. You're not going to get the crown if you didn't carry the cross. Right? You're not going to get the crown if you didn't carry the cross. And do you think that there is any saint in heaven right now that would say their afflictions in this life they were way too weighty? I mean, think of the Christians you know who have passed on. Well, let's think of the Apostle Paul. He's already told us they're not. But think of anybody else, John, Peter, anyone throughout her church history, you know, burned at the stake for their faith in Christ. Was it too weighty? Do you think they would say that? Right? Do you think that their suffering was too much in this life? Now, I need to correct something here just in case there's a potential error that people could have here, uh, and that is that maybe, maybe your afflictions all would add to your glory, Right? Well, here's the thing. Your afflictions are not the reason for your glory. Your afflictions are not the reason for your glory. Paul is not saying that your afflictions earn you glory. That would be wrong. No one's afflictions merit glory, as some may think. All right, so therefore they would say, well, the more afflictions, the more glory. Not at all. Because that's not the gospel. Every believer, whether greatly afflicted, or mildly afflicted, or all glorified, all enter into his glory. And what enables us uh, uh, to, to the glories of heaven is the work of Christ alone. Listen, it would be a lot harder for us, this group right here, if we were to transpose this church right now, I don't know, to North Korea, right? First of all, I don't think we could get together like this size. We'd have to be like two or three of us. But it would be a whole lot different. Our suffering would be greatly different. Our afflictions would, would multiply a hundred times over again. We couldn't be having Bibles out there. But we don't. We live in a place where we could still do this. So is all glory less than their glory? Do they get more glory because they lived in a tough spot? No. We all get glory. We're all glorified. We all get a resurrected, glorified body. Our souls are already resurrected, if you will, because they're alive. We'll get it, right? We all have, as Colossians 127 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. As 2 Peter 1 says, God called us to his own glory and excellence. He called us to this. Jude 124 says, the Lord will present you blameless before the presence of his glory. 2 Timothy 2.10 says, all the saints obtain salvation in Jesus with eternal glory. And Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, We are children of God and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If we indeed suffer with him, we will also be glorified together. So Paul was looking forward to glory. When his lowly body would be transformed into a glorious one, even like the one the Lord Jesus has now. He knew, as 1 Peter 5.10 says, that, that after he suffered a while, that the God of all grace would fulfill his call of him to the eternal glory in Christ. That's amen to that. And he knew this glory was weighty because he would be in the presence of the glorious one where there is no more sin, no sorrow, no death, suffering, weeping, but pure and holy worship. Do you ever think about that? We're going to worship him without the taint of sin, with our minds wandering around, struggling with this and struggling with that. We're going to worship him pure and holy. We can't do that now as hard as we try, as much as we want, but we will. And as frail as we are, he's still praised, and he is, he's pleased to accept our worship. 
No more devil, no more demons, nothing that defiles and destroys. There are no division, no cares, no worries. And where our bodies will be perfected, right? You have a struggle in your body, and I'm telling you, you got like, again, you got four or five decades on, there's something going on that you're not happy with. No more. Cancer's gone. Frailties are gone. Mental problems are gone, right? The frailty of the mind is gone. The struggles in the limbs are gone. All that's gone, right? No division, no cares, no worries. Everything will be perfected. All right? And we will be gazing upon the lover of our souls. And this will go on forever and ever. Can you imagine that? It's something so good, so glorious, that even to be in the presence of it for a minute would be overwhelming. But there's no more time because God wipes out time. No more sun, no more moon, no more stars. They're all gone, right? And what do we have? We have eternity. We'll be gazing upon the lover of our souls forever. And if we think about these things now, we'll be armed against losing heart or complaining or being discontent. John Calvin said this, a moment is long if we look at the things around us. But once we have raised our minds to heaven, a thousand years begins to look like a moment because of the eternal life that awaits us there. It's all perspective. So the first way not to lose heart is by knowing that the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. The second way not to lose heart is to have the right perspective on this life and the next one. And now the third way not to lose heart is by fixing your eyes on the unseen. Fixing your eyes on the unseen in verse 18. And there we read, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So Paul says, I don't look at the things that are seen. Why? Because they're temporary. Right? And the things which are seen are physical things, like the decaying of the body, or the inside of a prison cell, or how little food is on the plate, or what the living conditions are like. So he doesn't look at his literal troubles like the false teachers and the false apostles carrying around letters of recommendation and claiming Paul is a false teacher. He doesn't fix his eyes on his, on his Jewish and Gentile opponents. He doesn't fix his eyes on the literal mess the Corinthian believers are. You see, if your eyes are fixed on your troubles, you will lose heart. You'll lose heart. Uh, if your eyes are fixed on the moral demise of our society, and believe me, we're tanking fast, and the expansion of wickedness in it, you will lose heart. If you look at the lack of commitment among professing Christians and the worldliness that is embraced by so many who profess Christ, you're going to lose heart. If you fixate on, on the all-out affront against God and His Word and His Christ in every sphere of life now, you will lose heart. If you look at your money shrinking and your quality of life decreasing because of the prices of everything going up and you worry about it, you will lose heart. But Paul doesn't lose heart. He doesn't lose heart because he doesn't look at the things that he, that he can see or can be seen. He knows what they are. He knows they're there. It's not like he doesn't know they're there. He feels the effects of them, but they're not his focus. Why? Because they're temporary. Because they're temporary. Now the words to look actually are important words. Because they're not just like a glance or a passing look. Oh, I saw that. I saw that. They're not that way at all. Those words to look means to stare at to fixate on, to gaze upon. So, so Paul didn't set his gaze on temporary things. He didn't set his gaze on his troubles, right? Things that are here today and gone tomorrow, uh, things that are of no eternal consequence. And by the way, if you think about whatever your troubles are, I'm pretty positive most of them have no eternal effect one way or the other. They're not of eternal consequence, and yet we fixate on them. See, there's got to be a changing of the mind and then, and then, and then the heart receives the reality of, of what you have and you become a lot better with the struggles. Not that they're not real, right? We're never saying they're not real. We just deal with them better because we're not, we're not fixing on them. We're not fixing on them. Most things are just of no eternal consequence. 
Instead, he set his gaze on unseen things, uh, things which are not temporary but eternal, things like the gospel, the spread of the gospel, things like the souls of men which are eternal. You understand we share the gospel because men have an eternal soul. They're going somewhere. They're either going to heaven or going to hell. Right? And we know the truth. Like, we got the remedy. We got the remedy. It's called the gospel. And it means something. It means something. Things like what we said in verse 14, where, he's, where Paul said that he and all the saints would be raised up together when Christ returns. He's looking forward to that day when Christ returns. We all, as the people of God, get raised up from the graves and we're all with Christ in the air, on the new heaven, in the new earth, forevermore in glory. And it doesn't get, that's the grand finale, but it doesn't get better than that. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Things like the much more glory of the new covenant. So he looked to Christ, who was the author and the finisher of his faith, the one who came to seek him and to save him, the one who gave his life for him on the cross so that he could live forever with him in glory the one who reconciled him to the Father and made him pure and holy and blameless in his sight. You see, Paul was looking for and waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. He was looking for and waiting for the glorious appearing of his great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus chapter 2. So then he was like Moses, which Hebrews 11.10 says that by faith, was looking for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And then in verse 27, says that by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Why was that? For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured because his mind was set on eternal things. Right? So the saints can see what is invisible. You can see what is invisible. And you can see them with the eyes of your heart through the eyes of faith. The unbeliever can't see it. It don't make sense to them at all. But to you it does. To you it does. And that's because 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that you are no longer blinded by the God of this world. Before you were saved, you were under the sway of Satan. Your eyes, you were blinded from these truths. They didn't mean anything. You now have a hope, and that hope is true, and that hope is sure. And as Romans 8, 24 and 25 says, hope that is seen, hope that is not seen, hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? In other words, why do I hope for something that I already see? It's true, I see it in front of me, I know it. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. I can't see Christ physically. I can't see spiritual things physically, but I can see them through the eyes of faith. You can see them through the eyes of faith, and you wait. You wait for it, because you know it's true. So we're waiting for and trusting in and fixing our mind in and on the invisible world. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, the invisible world, right, that is described in the Bible is the only real world. Listen, you want reality? The reality is you can't see reality. It's invisible. It's invisible. But Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back for you. Do you believe that? Are you anchoring on that? Do you believe that he paved the way for you to be reconciled to God? And that heaven's got a spot for you right now because Christ has made it for you and he's coming back to give you that spot? Do you believe it? You can't see any of that, right? But you do believe it. If you're a Christian, you believe it because he says it. He's promised it's true and God doesn't lie. We need to anchor on those things. And how true is this? How true is this? Because the world is temporary. It's passing away. But the world to come is forever. So when we set our gaze on the eternal instead of the temporary, uh, on the unseen rather than the seen, uh, the, the inner man is, is, is being renewed. Uh, and it affects our perception of life. And we begin to grasp that, that the afflictions of this life are only momentary. Our struggles are only momentary. And what they're doing 
is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. And no matter what's going on in your life, physical, financial, relational, I mean, you name it, we're always going to be struggling with something and maybe many things at one time. But if you're a child of God, He's using those things to prepare you for glory, to wean you off of the world and to wean you off of sin and self and to, and to have you trust Him more and more. That's His goal. Remember, His goal is to make you more like Christ. Well, let me close by asking you three questions. And the first question is this. Do you focus more on the outward man or on the inward man? Do you focus more on the outward man or the inward man? And of course you must focus on the outward man. Well, oh, pass the pizza. I don't have to worry about anything. I say that. Right? You've got to feed the body. You've got to clothe the body. You've got to give it a little exercise, give it a little rest. I mean, you've got to do those things. Take it to the doctor when you're sick or whatever. You've got to take care of the outward man, clearly. But do you focus more on the outward man than the inward man? Are you, are you feeding and exercising the inward man? Or are you busy just with the outward man? And the inward man is starving. Are you starving on the inside? Is your soul famishing? Is it all about the outside? Is it all about the, the temporal, the job, the house, the money, the kids, the friends, the vacations? Is it all that? Nothing wrong with any of those things, by the way. But if that's all it is, you got a spiritual problem. Because the spiritual is not being fed. It's not being fed. Right? Are you feeding and exercising the inward man? Are you doing that? Brothers and sisters, we are spiritual people. And spiritual people are people who are alive for the very Spirit of God dwells in us. And we need to keep feeding it. We need to keep fueling our hearts and our minds with spiritual things, with the things of God. And to not make use of the graces that God gives us to feed the inner man is hurtful. Bible studies, Sunday school, men's breakfast, retreats, evangelism, prayer meetings. These are spiritual things for the purpose of building up the spiritual man or woman. But I fear that so many of us, we don't even care about those things or we just push it to the side. Listen, Sunday school, my opinion, and only my opinion, it's the best thing we do week in and week out. We're going through the 1689 confession. It's like systematic theology to the utmost. And yet, five people, six people, why? You could be fed, spiritually fed. 9.30, 9.30, 45 minutes of deep, deep truth to fill your soul. Tuesday night, come on, we're going to hear the word of God preach Tuesday night and we'll feed your body while we're there. Word of God, don't neglect the graces that God gives us to grow us. Coming to church every Sunday should not be a big deal for us. It should be the greatest thing we do. We should be so looking forward to this. We should be chomping at the bit to get here on Sunday morning. We should be preparing Saturday night. Put the clothes out. By the way, I do that. Put the clothes out to make sure that on Sunday morning we're not like trying to, oh, where's the tie? Oh, where's the shit? No, it's there. Ready to go. Kids are ready to go. Meals are made. We've prayed. We've listened to music. We've enjoyed God even before we get here. To feed the soul. We're spiritual people. We need spiritual things to feed our spirits. Amen? I'm not hopping on you. I'm encouraging you. My second question. Are you being renewed day by day? Uh, and, and the renewal that God gives is daily. Yesterday's grace, last week's grace, and ain't helping you today. That is not helping you today. We need grace every day for our troubles come up against us every day. And in order to be renewed daily, we need to have daily communion with God. We need daily communion with God. You see, you can't expect to be daily renewed if you are distant from the Lord most days of the week. And this behooves us to be in His Word daily, to be reading it daily, meditating upon it daily. It behooves us to be praying daily. It behooves us to be pleading with God to help us to live by what we're learning in his word. So then, are you in the habit of daily devotions? Are you in the habit of daily devotions? Because if you're not, then you're probably not being renewed daily in your inner man. That makes sense, right? If you want to be daily renewed in your inner man, we need to be daily talking to God and hearing from God. And if you're not, that means you probably lose heart easy by the curveballs that life throws us. And life throws us a lot of curveballs. 
May it be that the saints at Grace Baptist Church are constantly making provisions for the renewing of their inward man. Now, my third question is this. Do your sufferings and hardships and trials and troubles and afflictions cause you to long for the glory to come? Does the stuff that you don't like, you certainly wouldn't have signed up for, you didn't ask for, but the Lord has given you, a good and wise and loving Father has given to you, do they cause you to long for the glory to come? Does whatever you are going through today move you to think about an eternal weight of glory? If they do, then you are viewing them correctly. If they do, you are viewing them correctly. Then your mind is set on the eternal over the temporal. Then you are focusing on things that are of the greatest value, which are unseen things. But if they don't, if you are burdened by your troubles and they seem overwhelming to you and overbearing to you, then you need to ask God to refocus your heart. Refocus your heart. You need to plead with Him to give you a heavenly perspective. Because if you're a believer, you're a heavenly person already, right? You're already seated with Him in the heavenly places. Beg Him to help you think heavenly. Now, if your focus is never heavenly, if you really don't care about these things, then you don't really know God. And, and your outward man is perishing and your inward man is not renewed because it is spiritually still dead. And your afflictions are not momentary or light in your eyes, but you need to know that if you don't come to Christ, if you don't turn to Christ, if you don't repent of your sins and believe in Him for the forgiving of your sins and the saving of your soul, then your greatest affliction your greatest affliction still awaits you. And that is the judgment of your sin. And that is the eternal torment and judgment of your sin in a place called hell, which is never ending. And really, it's a place of forever agony and misery for the wages of your sin against God. But, but, if you look to things that are unseen today, stop looking at the literal. If you will look to things unseen, if you will look to God to forgive you of your sins, and trust that when Jesus was on the cross, he was on the cross for your sins. And he paid for them, every one of them, in his own body, on the tree. God poured out holy and divine justice on him for you. If you believe that, you look to Christ and believe in him because of his great love for you, he did that for you. Because of the Father's great love for you, he sent him to do that for you. And if you will surrender your life to him, guess what? He will forgive you, he will save you, and he will bring your inward man to life. And he will be preparing you for glory, amen? Oh, man, don't leave unsaved. In chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, I think, of, of this book, he's going to say, today is the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time. You don't know you got tomorrow. You don't know you have next week. You don't know you're not going to get hit by a, by a truck or a steel beam falling from the sky or fall into something that's going to swallow you up, or you're going to hear those words, you got six months to live. You don't know any of those things. No one does. Man knows not his days. Today, cry out for forgiveness and watch what he'll do. Let's pray. Father, how thankful we are that you brought our inner man to life. It came at a heavy cost cost Christ his life to bring us to life, but we praise you for it. We pray, O oh God, that you would encourage us, O oh God, not to lose heart, not to lose heart, not to look at things that are seen and, and let them rivet us, not to be focused on the temporal when the unseen things, the spiritual things are real and they can so encourage us Remembering, Lord, that glory is eternal and no matter what we go through now, it is really just for a short time. But we'll be in glory forever. We'll be praising you and worshiping you with Christ forever. And how we pray now that we would think more and more like that to help us through the struggles now and to bring you glory now. And Lord, for the soul or souls sitting here or watching this online who don't know Christ, who haven't truly been born again, their life does not exhibit a Christian heart. 
Lord, would you save them? Would you draw them? Would you bring them close, wrap them around the cross, and raise them to life? Would you do that, O God, for your glory's sake? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.